Ok, well, I guess we can, <coughs> we can start this recording. Yes, perfect. Ok. Mm -hmm. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, very nice to see you here. I'm re really glad you could join today for the first lecture of this second of cycle of the Land of Writing series. And our first speaker today is Julia Paxi, that you almost all uh, know. So, for those who do not know Juliana, uh, Juliana studied international relations and Egyptology in Budapest, and she wrote a PhD in Egyptology on the linguistic heterogeneity of the Ramesside royal inscriptions at the University of Basel and at the École Pratique des Hautes Études in Paris. Since 2021, she's a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Liège, where her research currently focuses on questions of intertextuality and textual transmission in the mid 18th dynasty Theban necropolis. So, Juliana, uh, whenever you want, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gala. Thank you for this kind introduction and good evening to everybody. Thank you for um, being here with me today. Uh, first of all, let me say um, thank you to Gala for inviting me to her online lecture series and for granting me the honor to open the winter session. Tonight, I will present you a case study on the challenges of identifying painterly handwritings in monumental inscriptions on the example of the ceiling texts of an 18th dynasty Theban tomb, TT84. I feel I owe you a small explanation on how I ended up diving deep into this subject. A little more than a year ago, I gave a talk at a conference in Paris where I discussed this ceiling text in their immediate and large, larger spatial context. And at the end of my talk, Lucia Diaz Iglesias asked me if I could tell how many artists worked on these inscriptions and how literate they were. Back then, I could not yet because the pictures I worked with didn't allow me to investigate the ductus of these texts. But ever since I've been reflecting on these questions and in spring this year, I went back to the field to have a closer look at these texts. And I've turned this research into a little side project of mine. And so here I am today with a belated answer to Lucia's question, and I'm thankful to her for inspiring me to dig deeper into this subject. The research for this talk was conducted at the University of Liège, but the reason why you also see the logo of the University of Basel on my title page is because the material I'm working um, with belongs to the concession of the Swiss mission at Sheik of the Agurna, a mission I've been part of since 2016. And it is with the kind permission of Susanna Bickel and Andrea Lopriano Gniers that I am allowed to work on this material at the University, University of Liège today. I'll start this lecture with a small introduction. Uh, first to the topic in general, namely with the question why we are looking into the painterly handwritings and what's the relevance of it. And with, the, with a few words on the tomb TT84 and by the text of the ceiling of its uh, transfers hall, a particularly suitable for our case study on distinguishing the work of individual persons. Then in the main and longest part of my talk, I'll establish the different hands we can tell apart on the ceiling. I'll do so by trying to be fully transparent about the methodology I'm using, as well as about its limitations with regard to the material at hand. In a further step, I'll try to assess the literacy of the individuals to whom these painterly handwritings belong. And finally, before concluding my talk, I'll also try to assess the possibility of tracking these artists in other monochrome texts within the tomb and in the decoration of other uh, Theban tombs within the necropolis. So let me start with a short introduction. The concept of painterly handwritings was established in Egyptology by Dimitri Labori in a paper written in 2012. In this paper, he argued that by adopting an archaeological perception of Egyptian art that allows us to see and consider the materiality of the object, we may be able to track the work of individual artists. In line with this material approach, similarly promoted by Octavier, he suggested that we look for the technical signature and the personal habits and practices of artists when trying to differentiate their work. This is in stark contrast with the so-called Morellian method, which was applied to Egyptian art with limited success in earlier years. This method mainly focused on comparing motifs of similar shape and didn't take into account the fundamental char characteristics of Egyptian art, namely its stylistic homogeneity and the neutralization of the personal style of individual artists. 
In recent years, the material archaeological approach to Egyptian art has been successfully applied to the Figaro painted decoration of Theban tombs by the Belgian team, Laurent Bavé, Dimitri Labori, and Uctavier, and also by Melinda Mel Hartwig, among others, as well as to the relief decoration of the chapel of the Hatshepsut in Dere Bakhri by Anastasia Stupko Lubczynska. Despite the growing awareness of the importance of materiality, Painted monumental inscriptions tend to escape similar investigations. Although even before the conscious turn of our, of our attention towards the technical signatures of ancient Egyptian artists approximately 10 years ago, the work of Maya Müller and Kathleen Keller has already demonstrated that it was indeed possible to distinguish between the hands of different individuals, not only in hieratic, but also in painted hieroglyphic inscriptions. The present paper sets out to do the same in the ceiling inscriptions of the transfer, transfer hall of TT84. The Theban necropolis is primarily, primarily known for its burials in the New Kingdom from the second half of the second millennium before Christ, Christ and is located on the west bank of the Nile opposite to today's Luxor in Upper Egypt. Theban tomb number 84 is found in the southwestern part of the hill of Sheikh Abdel Kurna in the immediate vicinity of TT 85, 97, 99, close to 95, 96 and 93. The numbers in white in the picture mark the tombs that belong to the concession of the University of Basel in this area. The tomb was originally built for Yamunetrek, an influential state official with remarkable career paths, who lived under the reign of Tutmosis III. He started his career as overseer of works while Hatshepsut was still in power. Then he later became first royal herald, which gave him the authority to speak for the king. He was also overseer of the gate to the royal palace and overseer of the granaries of Upper and Lower Egypt. Yamunetrek is one of the few officials who boast to have been present when Tutmosis III crossed the Euphrates during his Syrian campaigns in year 33 which indicates that he was quite close to the king and his influential position gave him easy access to the infrastructure necessary for building and decorating his tomb. Before turning our attention to part of the decoration that specifically interests us today, namely the ceiling text of the transverse hall, I need to mention that although geographically the entrance of TT84 is in the south and its central chapel is in the north, to make my presentation easier to follow, I will use the cardinal directions according to the ideal orientation of Theban tombs. So when I talk about the southern part of the first or transverse hall of the tomb, I mean um, the left wing um, of the, to the entrance. And by mentioning the northern part of the hall, I will refer to the wing right of the entrance. The Basel mission has recently discovered that the architectural plans of the tomb have been modified and this at a point in time when at least part of the chapel had already been decorated. What happened is that the transferred transverse hall and thus also the facade and the court was enlarged by 50% of its originally planned sides so that um, two side chapels could be appended to the south and north ends of the west wall of the first hall and these were then dedicated to Yamunetrek's parents. There is a paper in preparation on this subject by Andrea and myself that we hope to be able to publish soon. The ceiling of the transverse hall carries six long bands of text running parallel to one another along the east and west side walls. Besides, there is a short, highly fragmentary band crossing the ceiling from east to west in its middle, close to the entrance. All of them were written in blue monochrome hieroglyphs on a red background, and the space between them was filled with geometrical ornaments. The two fractures in the ceiling bear witness to the secondary extension of the hall and define the exact location where the text of the long bands would have ended if they had already been inscribed before the hall was enlarged. And indeed, epigraphic and compositional evidence suggests that some of the ceiling texts were already inscribed before the extension happened. The enlargement of the hall thus resulted in a double stage execution for some of these texts. Both outer bands, as well as the inner band in the south, the bands marked blue in the slide, seem to have been already complete before the extension of the hall. 
The change in the architecture plan therefore meant that these units of text had to be prolonged to fit a larger ceiling, whereas the other three, the two bands in the middle of the ceiling and the inner band in the north wing, could from the outset be designed 50% longer than they would have been without the secondary enlargement of the hall. I wrote a longer study on this subject that should be published soon. Now, what um, makes TT84 particularly suitable for a case study on distinguishing artistic hands in painted monumental texts lies exactly in this double stage exec execution of some of its ceiling bands. They provide namely a unique point of departure for investigating whether or not the secondary edit segments of text were painted by the same artists who were responsible for the text that were previously added to the ceiling. In other words, the question is if the portions of text here transcribed in black um, were painted by the same individuals as the one trans transcribed in blue. Note that the transcription colors, black and blue, are only used here for demonstration purposes. They should help us differentiate between the secondarily and primarily added text segments. But in reality, all ceiling texts were painted in blue with a white foundation on a red background. A quick look at the ornamental decoration of the ceiling suggests that we will likely find different hands at work in the two executional phases of the ceiling inscriptions. While some of the long ceiling bands were not inscribed before the enlargement of the hole, it seems that the ornamental decoration was already finished on the entire surface of the ceiling. What is more, it appears that different individuals were responsible for covering the additionally gained surface than the ones who started the pattern. This we can deduce from the fact that the geometrical ornaments were painted slightly differently on the two sides of the fracture in all four cases. The difference is perhaps least evident in the case of pattern D on the slide, but also here there is a small but telling dissimilarity between the parts painted before and after the enlargement of the hole. The section that was painted earlier, the part on the left side of the brake line, contains namely a small mistake. The last green zigzag line is not followed by a red one, as the logic of the pattern would dictate, but by a floral motif. This imprecision was corrected in the secondary executed part of the ornament because the sequence is correct on the right side of the fracture. Um, one last word before I turn to the painterly hand things of the ceiling inscriptions. You may wonder what I'm specifically looking for in this at first slide, indeed very homogeneous looking material that could possibly betray the different individuals at work. Um, I'm looking for differences in the overall layout and the general appearance of the text and note if it has a regularly spaced or crowded appearance, if, it, if the neatness of the execution of the signs tends to deteriorate as the text unfolds, if the signs are kept straight in the entire segment concerned, or if they are acquire a slight left or rightward tilt over time. I also examine the brush handling and note variations in the density of the ink and its color, the size and steadiness of the brush strokes, and in a number of tips and retouchings if visible. I also pay attention to the paleographic variations between the different realization of individual signs and wherever possible, I analyze the direction and the sequencing of, sequencing of the brush, stroke, brush strokes constituting a sign. You will see that with the help of the paleography and the ductus, I often single out and try to follow so-called diagnostic signs or distinctive spelling, spellings that seem to vary from individual to individual. I found that it can be helpful to also consider such factors as the artist's occasional reliance on preparatory drawings and the presence or absence of auxiliary lines marking the position of the signs within the band. And finally, I also take notice of further idiosyncrasies and spelling habits, such as the artist's occasional preference for simplifying certain signs, the tendency for sign reversals, or the density of the evidence for editorial activity, by which I mostly mean minor corrections in the band. If you attended the lecture of Renaud Pietri in the series earlier this year, or have read Stefan Poli's latest article on the messy scribe from Dera Medina, you will notice that my methodology is not that different from my colleagues who deal with hieratic texts on papyri or ostraca. 
The main difference is that the personal style of an individual is more quickly neutralized in painted monumental inscriptions than in hieratic texts, which means that we will end up with few clues per hand and we will have to be more prudent in our conclusions. The situation is, of course, not made easier by the fact that here we are dealing with a relatively short segment of texts, so the sample size per hand will be also rather small. So let's get started. First, um, we will turn our attention to the segments of text that were already finished when the hole was only about 10.5 meters and not 16 meters long. In this phase, only the two side bands of the south wing and the outer band of the north wing were filled with text. The first text on our list, the inner or west band in the south wing, is a horizontal inscription that was written from right to left and was originally about, only about 5.3 meters long. Unfortunately, only less, less than half of the text is preserved today, but the rest can be reconstructed from parallels. Like all uh, long ceiling bands on the transverse hall, also this one contains a Hotep Dinisu offering formula with wishes for the disease. Befitting its placement, it's an Osiris offering formula with such motives evoked in it as to traveling in the divine boat, the receipt of a place um, uh, in the district of Peker, a place in the Bidos where Osiris was buried, and the Ba's place in heaven and the corpses in the Duat. As you can see in the segment well preserved, the person responsible for the original inscription of this band, our artist A, had an extremely precise brush handling, worked with very elegant, thin and regularly spaced hieroglyphs with clear and precise contours, and he made his pa paint very dense and made sure that the blue and white layers of paint always fully overlapped. The number one in parentheses after the de designation artist A on the slide only indicates that this is the first segment of text attributed to this individual. These numbers will be helpful when we start comparing certain features across the ceiling. No uh, preliminary drawings can be detected in this part of the band, but the red auxiliary line marking the position of the signs within the band is still visible in part. Here above the head of the copra, the upper one clearly comes to light. In terms of paleography and ductus, you will see that there is quite some variation across the ceiling in terms of how the phonogram N was written. Artist A never abbreviates the ripple of water and usually builds it up from relatively many line segments, 14 or more. To the feet of the quilt trick, he generally adds backward facing toe, a feature that is usually missing in the case of the other artists. The R he builds up from two strokes, starting with the lower one and finishing with the upper one. In the case of sign N14, the star, he first paints the horizontal part from left to right, then the vertical part in one go from top to bottom and from left to right. The originally inscribed part of the opposite side of the ceiling, the east or outer band of the south wing, similarly seems to be the work of our artist A. As opposed to the inner band, this is a left to right horizontal text. Um, and the large part of it is actually missing, but can be similarly reconstructed with the help of a nearby parallel. It is an almond ray offering formula with an inv invocation offering for the deceased. And as you can observe in the segment highlighted, highlighted above, the band gives a rather balanced visual impression, and it seems to have been painted by a very steady and secure hand. The hieroglyphs are built, are beautifully drawn with lots of attention to their details. The white foundation of the signs is generally fully covered by the blue layer of paint. And although it is left to right, it is a left to right inscription, there are no sign reversals present in this segment. Similarly to the opposite side of the ceiling, there are no preliminary drawings in this part of the band, but the red auxiliary lines marking the position of the signs within the band are sometimes visible. Also here, the ripple of water is built up from relatively many line segments, and the quail chick features the backward facing toe. The direction and the sequencing of, sequencing of the brush strokes building up the sign R matches those on the opposite side of the ceiling. The sign is built up from two strokes, starting with the lower one and finishing in the upper right corner of the sign. 
The ductus is the same in the case of the I hieroglyph as well. There is a third segment of text on the ceiling that can be attributed to our artist A, the short vertical band in the middle of the ceiling running from east to west. It contains a fragmentary preserved nude spell from which practically only the words uh, dread, sep, sen, forever and ever remain. The precision, precision of the brush handling, the fully overlapping white and blue layers of paint and the care with which the signs were drawn speak for the work of our artist A. Paleographically, not only the sign T, but also the cobra seems to correspond to other examples of the same signs by this hand. By the two long bands that were finished in the south wing before the extension of the hole, as well as the nude spell in the middle of the ceiling seem to have been painted by the same hand, the east or outer band of the north wing was in all likelihood realized by a different person, artist B. The east band of the north wing is um, a horizontally written segment of text running from left to right, large parts of which are missing but could also be reconstructed with the help of a nearby parallel. The band contains a Hotep Diniso offering formula of Rei Harakti, and accordingly, one of the main motifs evoked in the text has to do with the deceased's wish of seeing the sun. In terms of the general layout of the text, the work of the artist responsible for this band is very similar to that of artist A. The text was written by a steady hand. The signs are very elegant, evenly spaced and carefully executed. Nonetheless, part of the inscription shows a slight left foot tilt especially the signs before and after the major lacuna in the text. The white and the blue layers of paint usually fully overlap, although at times not as precisely as in the case of artist A. Besides, there is no trace of any preparatory drawing in this band, nor were any auxiliary lines used to help with the placement of the signs, as opposed to what we saw in the case of artist A. At the level of individual signs, there are also small differences compared to those painted by artist A. For instance, the R is uh, written starting from the right corner of the sign. I think it's better if I show you. So starting in the right corner of the sign, following the shape to the left on the top and finishing with the lower stroke from left to right. And um, while Actually, artist A prefers to start, start the other way around by first painting the lower stroke and then the upper one. The comparison of these signs um, should also make it uh, obvious that artist A worked with thinner strokes, but with thicker paint than artist B, and that he also paid better attention to the overlap of the first and second layers of paint. Similarly, in this band, the quail trick is missing the backward facing toe, so typical so typical for artist A. There is only one dubious example, the very first one, where it seems as if it had been painted in white. Also, the legs of the bird appear straighter, often lacking the more pronounced bending of the front leg present in the work of the artist A. Also in the case of sign A55, depicting a mummy lying on bed, used as the classifier of the word shot corpse on the ceiling, the two artists seem to have chosen a slightly different realization of the same sign. While the back of the mummy doesn't touch the bed in the case of artist A, the furniture and the body form one piece in the case of artist B. But it's more not only the not only the mummy but also the bed, especially its legs, receive more uh, articulate details in the work of artist A than in the work of artist B. Let me return to our overview slide and sum up the situation concerning the ceiling texts before the extension of the hole. It seems that the few bends that were realized before the second enlargement of Yamunetrek's tomb happened were the work of two separate individuals, artists A and B. Artist A focused on the text in the south wing, and in the meantime, artist B started with the bends in the north wing. Now the question is, who were responsible for prolonging the already existing bands and for filling in the ones previously left blank. To formulate it differently, we have to find out who painted the inscriptions transcribed in black on the slide. 
I will start this quest by first looking at the prolonged segments of the previously discussed text. That means the final third of the two side bands of the south wing and the closing part of the east band of the north wing. I'll start our investigation in the south wing by looking at who completed the work of artist A in the west and east bands. Um, let's follow the same sequence as before and start with the west band. Now, what interests us is only the final part of this band, the approximately 2.6 meter long text segment running from left to right above the yellow arrow in the picture, a secondary addition to the Hotep Dinusu formula to Osiris painted by artist A. In terms of content, it complements the text with an additional motive by wishing for the unhindered movement of the deceased soul and for its successful arrival in the netherworld. Already a quick look at the ceiling suffices to tell that this section was not only added to the ceiling at a different time than the text painted by artist A. This alone we can deduce from the different shade of the blue paint before and after the break line, marking the origin and southern limit of the ceiling. But that the painterly handwriting likely belongs to a different artist than the ones we know from the first phase. The signs are compacter, narrower and less precisely drawn than the ones in the preceding part of the band. The contours are more, are more fluid and less exact. The blue paint no longer covers the white foundation of the signs. Also, the overall layout of the text appears more crowded. The arrangement of the sign is dense and non-regular. The artist um, continuing the test, text, labeled here as artist C, relied on white preparatory, preparatory drawings and a pair of white auxiliary lines for determining the position of his signs within the band. He also the habit of posing at the edges of lines and letting his paint form small blobs there. His imprecise contours and the fact that he was inclined to retouch his strokes gives his painting style an overall impression of insecurity. In terms of spelling habits, our artist C had a strong preference for abbreviating the ends with a simple stroke. He did so six times in 14 occurrences. And even when he made the effort to paint the ripple of water, he usually built it up from relatively few line segments, 10 or 12. His quail chicks appear misshapen when compared to those painted by artists A or B. The, case, um, the cases where the sequencing and the dire direction of his brush strokes can be clearly traced. Similarly, the liver requires some information about his painting technique. For instance, his R's are similar to those of artist B in the sense that both of them start with the upper line. However, while artist B seems to paint his upper line from right to left, artist C does so from left to right. This I admit is difficult to demonstrate with the close-ups I have, but I took these notes in the field. Maybe I also show them with the laser point and that will be easier. So artist B does it like this. And um, Artist C, like this. Furthermore, as opposed to artist A, artist C builds up his sign N14 from three instead of two strokes. The sequencing and the direction of which clearly differ from those of artist A. It turns out that our artist C was not only responsible for finishing the west band in the south wing, but also for prolonging the one on the opposite side of the ceiling, the east band, which was originally similarly the work of artist A, as we have seen before. In terms of content, further wishes were added on behalf of the deceased soul to the previously complete Amunri offering formula, some, which, some of which repeat previous motives in the band. So, for instance, the motive of drinking water at the eddy of the river appears here for the second time in the band in the secondarily added part of the text. Also in in the case of the East Band, there is an unmistakable visual contrast between the primarily and secondarily executed segments of text. There is a difference in the exact shade of blue used before and after the break line, and just like on the opposite side of the ceiling, the brush handling becomes visibly more insecure and less exact in the final third of the band. The signs tend to appear skew and cramped, and the white and blue layers of paint also no longer fully overlap. Although they appear somewhat fainter than in the final part of the West Band, traces of the white preparatory drawings and the two white parallel lines marking the position of the hieroglyphs within the band are still visible in the most part of the closing section of the band. 
in this picture, you can also see very well one of the further idiosyncrasies of artist C, namely his habit of posing his brush strokes and brush brushes at the edges of lines and letting the paint form uh, small blobs there. I'm sure you haven't forgotten that he's our lazy artist in the sense that he's, he's the one who has the tendency to, whenever possible, simplify some of his signs. In this text segment, he doesn't only occasionally substitute the ripple of water with a simple horizontal stroke for the phonogram N, or otherwise paints them from relatively few line segments, but also chooses a more simplified rendering for the phonogram Hennet than, for instance, artist A at the beginning of the text. Since, as opposed, as opposed to the final segment of the West Bend, here we are dealing with the left to right inscription, one of his further habits also comes to light, which is his tendency for sign reversals. Egyptians, uh, Egyptians were more accustomed to writing from right to left than from left to right. Therefore, writing left to right inscriptions re required additional mentor, mental effort to them. Thus, orientation mistakes are much more common in left to right inscriptions than in right to left ones. While artist A didn't include any such mistakes in the previous part of the text, artist C consistently reversed um, the folded close three times and the sign for Ma also twice. So we have just established that the inscriptions originally painted by artist A in the south wing were continued by artist C after the enlargement of the whole. Nonetheless, the work of artist B in the east band of the north wing seems to have been continued not by artist C, but by another individual whom I label here as artist D. You may remember that this fragmentary preserved band originally contained the right to left horizontal inscription and offering formula to Reha Rakti. What interests us this time is the painterly handwriting of the person who added an additional 2.6 meters of text to this Hotep Dinisu formula. This is the segment that um, runs right above the yellow arrow in the picture. The text that continues the work of artist B introduces a further deity, Anubis, and concludes the band with a longer invocation offering. Just like in the case of the two side bands in the south wing, also here, visually, it is almost immediately obvious where the originally painted text segment ends and where the secondary edition starts. The exact shade of the blue applied before and after the extension of the hole differs slightly. And so does the density of the paint. Both the white and the blue layers become visibly more watery than in the first two thirds of the band. There is a perceptible difference, not only in the composition, but also in the application of the paint. The white and blue layers no longer, no longer fully overlap. And seemingly very little attention was paid back to keeping the contours clean. Also, the brush handling becomes highly insecure and inexact, and often it looks as if the artist's hand had been trembling. There are also traces of spilled and smeared paint in the band, just like here on the slide. Moreover, the distribution of the signs is occasionally uneven or asymmetric, just like here in the case of the name of the god Anubis. And there is also a slight upward tilt in the entire final segment of the band. This, the uneven distribution of the signs and the fact that the text sometimes gets too close to the edges of the band are all factors that are in part also explained by the fact that the artist did not use any preparatory drawings, nor did he rely on um, any of the real lines concerning the placement of the signs within the band. Despite the differences in the layout of their texts and their brush handling, in terms of spelling habits, artist D shares some similarities with the person finishing the two sidebands side in the south wing. Both artist C and artist D prefer, prefer building up their end signs from relatively few line segments, from 10 to 12 on average. Although the ripples of water of artist C all seem to, uh, artist D actually, uh, all seem to deal downward, which is not the case with artist C. They, pull, they both paint their R, R, slide, R signs bottom up, starting with the upper brush stroke. They also both have rather misshapen, even though not fully comparable, quail tricks, and have the tendency of abbreviating certain signs. Nonetheless, 
artist D only has a simplified rendering for the phoneme Hennet, which however differs from the one used by artist C in that it contains four vertical lines instead of three and two horizontal ones instead of one. Besides, as opposed to artist C, artist D refrains from using simple horizontal lines instead of the ripples of water. Now that we know that the work of artist A was continued by artist D, and if we accept that artist D was res responsible for prolonging the band painted by artist B, we only have to find out who painted the two bands that were realized in their entire length in one go. Uh, three bands, actually, sorry. The two central bands and the west uh, or in the band of the north wing, the ones where there are no artists assigned yet on the slide. Okay. The inner band of the north wing seems to be the work of an artist we already encountered, that of artist C. This is uh, one of the bands that was painted in its entirety only after the hole has been enlarged. It is a horizontal left to, left to right inscription running from the middle of the ceiling towards the northern limit of the hole, following the course of the arrow on the slide. As you can see already here, the text is only fragmentarily preserved. Nonetheless, the location of the band within the tomb and some of its formulations suggest that at least one of the deities mentioned in the band was Osiris. The text very likely started with an invocation offering, which was followed by further wishes concerning the sustenance of the deceased soul. And after a long list of epithets, the band um, ended with Yamunetrak's filiation. The hand that painted this band seems to be that of artist C. We recognize him by the somewhat uneven overall visual impression of the band, which results from his brush handling and his lack of attention to the contours of the signs. The inexact overlaps between his white and blue layers of paint, the at times irregular arrangement and the slight skewness of his signs, and also from his habit of posing at the edges of lines and letting the paint form small blobs there, which is perhaps less apparent on this picture, but we can see some signs of this habit, for example, um, here. You can also see uh, parts of the two white auxiliary lines that guided the artist's hand when positioning the signs within the band. We know from his work in the South Wing that artist C had a tendency to rely on such guidelines. Here, however, he seems to have worked without preparatory drawings. As also elsewhere on the ceiling, the simplified renderings of the phoneme N and Hennet and the relatively short ripples of water, which are all present in this band, are typical for art artist C. There is one more thing I absolutely must show you in this band, a detail that really managed to confuse me. The picture may already be familiar to you because this is the one God advertised my talk with. What we are witnessing here is the major interruption in the painting process, which is revealed by the unmistakable change in the intensity of the color blue applied in the middle of the word Shemsu, meaning allegiance or followers. And by the segment leading up to the phonetic complement S of the phonogram Shemes was painted in a faint shade, the second half of the word Shemsu followers and all subsequent signs of the text were realized in a much stronger color. Curiously, from this point onwards, the orientation of sign S29 is also systematically reversed in the band, as you can see, for instance, in the case of the sign above the point of the arrow. This was not the case before. Interestingly, however, this disruption in the workflow does not coincide with the fracture in the ceiling, nor with any other meaningful place in the text. It seems as if the artist had stopped in the middle of the word and not only to redeep his brush, but perhaps to prepare, prepare a fresh pot of paint. I spent hours in comparing the signs within the band before and after this point in the text. And here you see some examples from the two different segments of the band. C3A, marking those before the fresh pot of paint appears on the ceiling, and B, uh, those after that point. But I see no significant difference neither in the overall appearance of the text nor in the paleography or ductus of individual signs that would account for a personal change. Therefore, I venture to say that it must be the same individual, our artist C, who continued painting the text, 
trust perhaps with a somewhat lower level of mental engagement that one he mastered in the first half of the band, which would account for his sudden sign reversals, a habit that is also otherwise characteristic for artists C in left to right text, as we saw earlier. For the central band of the South Wing, we seem to have a new person in charge. Um, this band is a right to left vertically written text that runs from the middle of the ceiling towards the starting limit of the hole. It was originally nearly eight meters long, but today, unfortunately, only the last few meters are preserved. Nevertheless, I'm hoping to be able to reconstruct at least part of the missing text in the not so distant future with a recently discovered parallel from TTC3. As for the content, it is an offering formula to probably Reharakti with the deceased application to the god in first person singular, asking him to illuminate for him the way to the netherworld. In terms of painting technique and style, this band carries some of the finest and most delicately executed signs on the entire ceiling of the hall. Artist E painted the text with thin, smooth and steady strokes and with lots of attention to the details. He is, for instance, the only one who paints the whiskers of the hair. The neatness of this hand deteriorates, deteriorates, however, the closer we get to the end of the band. Here, the white and blue layers of paint no longer fully overlap, and some of the signs appear skew. The sudden change in the quality of the work must, to a large extent, be due to the increasingly challenging working conditions towards the end of the band. I think it is easy to imagine that painting a vertical inscription running towards the edge of the ceiling like three meters above the ground level, must be increasingly challenging as the space available for the artist gradually shrinks away and he finds himself pressed against the adjoining wall. Although the layout of the text and the brush handling are totally different, similarly to artist C, also artist E relies on a pair of white auxiliary lines for placing his signs within the band. And sometimes even a few traces of white preliminary drawings can be detected as faint silhouettes around some signs. The hand working on the south and central band is characterized by a few idiosyncrasies that are otherwise absent from the ceiling. For instance, the legs of the quail chicks um, and the head of um, the snake are often painted slightly detached from their bodies. Besides, the artist has two distinct ways of painting the quail tricks, one of which the examples in the middle closely resembles the signs of artist A, who systematically added the backward facing to the feet of the bird. As opposed to the solution of artist A, who seems to add this feature with a separate stroke of paint, artist E simply draws an elongated feet line. One of the most curious instances is nevertheless the way artist E builds up the twisted flex for the sign age. Instead of a fluid twisted line, he paints three separate circles that join like a chain. Furthermore, artist E's ripples of water are some of the longest on the entire ceiling. He tends to build them up from 14, 16 or even 18 line segments in which he resembles our artist A. And as opposed to artist C, he never abbreviates the sign. There is one, ver one more band we need to have a closer look at, which is the central band of the North Wing, another originally almost eight meter long vertical inscription, but as opposed to the one in the South Wing, this one is written from left to right. I left this one deliberate to the end of my talk because its painterly handwriting is a little ambiguous, and for long I've labeled it for myself as artist F. But the more I looked at it, the more I was convinced that here we are dealing with another segment realized by artist B. Do you remember him? He was the one who already worked in the North Wing before the tomb got enlarged, but only managed to finish one inscription before the extension of the hole. As for the content of this inscription, it is another Hotep Dini's offering formula, but with two deities evoked in it, one of which must be Amun Rei. The text is concerned with the sustenance, sustenance of the soul of the deceased and wishes for him a beautiful burial. The inscription was painted in regularly spaced, comparably large hieroglyphs, and much, much attention seems to have been paid to the aesthetically pleasing arrangement of the signs, although it is a left-to-right inscription which for certain artists meant an additional challenge, 
our artist B coped it without any major hiccups. The brush handling is relatively steady and secure, but the blue layer of paint doesn't always fully cover the white foundations of the sign. Signs, but the discrepancies between the two layers are never as large as in the case of artist C or artist D. Similarly to the case of the South and Central Band, the quality of the work deteriorates in the last approximately two meters of the band. Here the signs become hasty and less accurate, and although the blues, blue was consistently applied also to the end of the inscription, it has faded away beyond recognition in certain parts because the last pot of paint turned out to be too watery. It seems as if the artist had deliberately diluted the paint in order to make it last for the remaining segment, which gives the impression as if he would have had to or would have wanted to finish the work rather quickly, in which the increasingly challenging working conditions towards the edge of the ceiling likely played a role. While artist B did not use any auxiliary lines of preliminary drawings in the outer band of the north wing, which he painted before the extension of the hall, here, similarly to the bands realized by artists C and E, he was guided by two parallel lines marking the position of the signs within the band and relied on wide pre-drawn hieroglyphs by painting the text. If my assumption is correct, then this band is indeed the work of artist B, this would mean that the use of preliminary drawings and auxiliary lines should not be regarded as a hard criterion for identifying painterly handwritings. Let me show you some of the signs that helped me connect the dots and merge my initial artist F with artist B. It was actually his owls that caught my eye, which often appear a little puffy, especially in comparison with the slimmer renderings of the sign by the other artist on the ceiling. Of course, the sequencing and the direction of the brush stroke used to paint the phoneme are also matches. The artist B systematically starts with the upper stroke and finishes with the low one, drawing the upper line from right to left and then the lower one from left to right. His quail chicks are less well preserved here than in the eastern sign band, um, but also they are comparable in form and execution. So if my analysis is correct, two artists, artists A and B, worked on the ceiling text before the extension of the hall, but only one of them, artist B, returned after the change in the architectural plans of the tomb happened. Instead of artist A, however, three new artists joined in, artist C, D and E, and helped artist B to complete the textual program of the ceiling. In order to be able to say anything about the literacy of these artists, we first have to reject the often assumed dichotomy between scribes and the so-called seshkedu, the scribes of forms, painters or draftsmen responsible for the paintings in these tombs. In fact, the latest research of Dimitri Labori demonstrated that the artists responsible for the picture of decoration of Theban tombs were, at least in most cases, also the ones who painted the inscriptions accompanying the scenes. We also know that in training, um, artisting and writing exercises not infrequently occur together. As a consequence, we can assume that also the art artists working on the ceiling of the transfers hall of TT84 likely received at least some scribal training. And thus, based on the detailed analysis of their work, we are indeed able to assess their level of literacy, at least in relative terms. Artists A and B, A, B and E, whose texts are virtually exempt of mistakes, sign reversals and traces of secondary edi editorial activity, must have been certainly more literate than artists C and D. I often, ref often refer to artists C's obvious difficulty with retaining the correct orientation of signs in left to right inscriptions. We also saw that in the west end of the north wing, he must have prepared himself a himself a fresh pot of paint while he was in the middle of a word, which indirectly demonstrates that his level of mental engagement with the text must have been relatively low. But I haven't mentioned yet is that his segments of text also, sh also show traces of minor corrections. In the final segment of the South Wing, for instance, one of the Alephs, the second one in the phrase, um, Seba and Duat, the portal of the Duat, was originally an owl. The fact that the head part of this sign was made more prominent than usually must be the result of the effort to mask the original mistake. 
which is then a further proof that artist C was not mentally engaged with the content of the text he was copying. The West End of the North Wing contains corrections of a different sort. Here, the placement or the orientation of certain signs has been secondarily modified. In the first example, it is the orientation of the sign for Nejam, sweet in the phrase, um, the sweet breath of the North Wing that has been altered. And in the second example, the classifier for the verb peri to come forth has been shifted. But leave serious doubts about artist D's literacy beyond, of course, the overall visual appearance of the text he was responsible for is his insecurity regarding the shape of certain hieroglyphic signs, which is perhaps most evident in the two examples shown on the screen. Compared to him, artist C at least always seems to have known what he should be painting. So our original chart should perhaps be modified like this. But even in the case of artists A, B and E, who seem to be at the top of their craft, what can we really tell about their absolute level of literacy? What if with their high level of mental engagement with the text they were painting, or their expertise and experience in their craft as painters, they could in fact, in most cases, hide how little they understood of the text they were supposed to put on the wall or on the ceiling? I can't help but think of the, let's say, inherited scribal mistake present in the west bend of the south wing, artist A failed to correct. And I'm asking myself um, if he could have corrected it had he been a better scribe. This mistake concerns the phrase U Peker, the district of Peker, which is present in both Yamunajak's text and also in its close textual parallel in the nearby tomb of Amenem Hart, from which the segment was very likely copied. The phrase has an erroneous spelling in both versions because the sign P is missing in both instances. TT82 has therefore three superfluous plural strokes, which must be a corruption for the P sign, the hieratic form of which is closely similar. Even an old note in the digital slip archive of the Werther book calls our attention to the fact that one of the two tombs must have copied the other. The fact that the passage arrived without these plural strokes into TT84 suggests that the text was copied from TT82 to TT84. In this transmission process, the person responsible for copying the passage apparently tried to make sense of the garbled phrase, edited away the superfluous plural strokes, but failed to recognize the origin of the mistake and the underlying word pecker. Doesn't the fact that artist A didn't notice the missing P shed light on his poor level of literacy if measured in absolute terms. It is only a rhetorical question, of course, that I must ask, must ask nonetheless to show you the difficulty of such investigations. I promised you that I would also assess the possibility of checking these artists also elsewhere within the tomb. Already a first quick in investigation delivered quite promising results. Artist E, for instance, seems to have been responsible for at least one of the ceiling texts also on the ceiling of the South Chapel of the tomb. Although we can see that the quality of his work is inferior to that on the ceiling of the first hall, he, his idiosyncratic way of painting the twisted flax and the relatively short stick in the hand of sign D40 give him away. Artist B, on the other hand, seems to have painted also the ceiling text of the corridor. This text calls to mind his artistic style, not only by the overall appearance of the hand, but there are also striking similarities um, at the level of individual signs. The band contains namely a more elaborate rendering of sign U7, just like the central band of the north wing of the first hall. And we also find a relatively well-fed version of the owls, so characteristic of this hand. Checking our artists outside within TT84, uh, in 84 is one thing, but trying to identify their work elsewhere in the necropolis is an altogether different challenge. In theory, it is possible for sure, but in practice, we do not have enough data at our disposal to conduct such investigations from the distance. Um, this year in spring, I had the chance to visit a few contemporary tombs in the di direct vicinity of TT84. And in the corridor of TT97, in the tomb of Amenem Hat, the high priest of Amun under Tutmosis III, at first sight I thought I could be looking at the hand of our artist A, 
And not only because of the matching color palette of the two tombs, but mostly because of the extremely precise brush handling of the artist who painted these texts. At a closer look, however, it turned out that the polography of way too many signs just simply didn't match those of artist A. For instance, the quail chicks are missing their backward facing toe and the lions have a different tail than those painted by artist A. In TT99, the tomb of San Neferi, the royal chancellor at the time of Yamunetrach, I similarly marveled at the precision with which the ceiling text of its first half were painted. Here you are looking at the central band of the North Wing, which is one of the bands that shows the closest similarities with the work of our artist A. Yet also here, upon closer inspection, it turned out that the two individuals were not the same. The work of the artist who painted these signs is even more sophisticated than that of our artist A. His brush lines are thinner and the details of his hieroglyphs are even more precise than those of artist A. To wrap up, the aim of this talk was to demonstrate the possibility and the challenges of identifying painterly handwriting and writings in monochrome painted monumental inscriptions simply with epigraphic methods. And as we saw, it is possible to distinguish the work of individual persons despite the neutralizing effect of Egyptian art on, indi on individual style. But it is a highly time intensive endeavor and one that cannot be done with the help of publications, but requires field work or very high resolution photographs. It is however clear that further, more extensive studies will be required to refine the methodology here applied. And if possible, it would also be beneficial to seek help from other disciplines. Here I'm thinking mostly of the chemical analysis of the paint, which could potentially show differences from artist to artist. With respect to my methodology, I must admit, the question I most struggled with was to decide for how much variation I should allow for regarding ductus and paleography. For instance, could it be that our artist D, the one who seems the least skilled of all, was in fact our artist C, under extreme time pressure or working with insufficient light? The paleography of certain signs speaks against this, but the possibility is still worth to consider. Or do you remember the case of the east band of the north wing, the one where the workflow was interrupted in the middle of a word? Wouldn't it have been artist B who started that band, worked less precisely and faster than usually, and gave it over to artist C to finish? If my original hypothesis is incorrect, and it was not artist C who painted the entire band, but artist B was responsible for the first part of it, the concentration of the work of the more skilled individuals to the middle part of the room and the work of those with less expertise towards the edges of the hall would reveal an important fact about labor distribution with, with respect to the future visibility of the inscriptions. Those parts of the text that would have been more likely to be seen would have been executed by artists A, B and E, whereas those that were likely remain in the dark when visitors came by artists C and D. By all means, one thing is for sure. If we can force ourselves to slow down and not only read these texts, but also look at their materiality, we can find out much more about the practices and processes of textual production than we ever imagined. And indeed, we may also be able to distinguish the work of individual persons. And before I let you go, I realize I still owe you an explicit answer to the question, how many artists worked on the ceiling text of a Theban tomb? In this specific case, probably five or four at a minimum, at least according to the current state of my research. But considering the fact that a few weeks ago I would have said six, this number may be subject to further changes in the future. So, so much about working progress. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very Thank you much. Very much. Uh, that was uh, fascinating, fascinating, actually. Uh, really. <laughs> so now.